All right, so I'm David Wilner for the CFA, and I'm up here uh, in place of Andrea Sella, who's participating remotely. By way of background, the uh, NGVLA Science Advisory Council, together with the community, created an initial set of five key science goals to help drive the design of the NGVLA. And there are uh, posters and poster flash talks on, on each of them. And in no particular order, this is the first one, unveiling the formation of solar system analogs on terrestrial scales. Um, the fundamental properties of planets, their masses, compositions, orbital architectures are set during a brief formation phase in disks of gas and dust around young stars. And one approach to understanding the diversity of these planetary systems is to characterize these disks, including the uh, dust features that are created by planet disk interactions. And the NGVLA will uniquely access the terrestrial planet forming zone by going to long wavelengths where the disk dust becomes transparent by providing milliarc second resolution, um, which is sub AU for hundreds of targets in nearby star forming regions and providing the high sensitivity needed to image thermal dust emission. If you want more, poster 78. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Brett McGuire. I'm representing key science goal number two on the NGVLA. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the NGVLA recognized that astrochemistry was going to be a major science driver for this telescope and spun us up a brand new key science goal in, rep uh, in recognition of that. Uh, so the NGVLA is going to be basically the best telescope in the world for looking at medium and large size complex organic molecules in basically any environment you could care about from external galaxies all the way down to protoplanetary disk scales. Um, so we have a bunch of different examples of uh, simulations and, and use cases out on poster. I think it's either 16 or 17 just out the door here uh, by the coffee. So stop by and say hello. Thanks, everyone. So hello again. I'm Alberto Volato, representing Key Science Hall number three for the NGVLA, which is charting the assembly, structure, and evolution of galaxies through cosmic time. And we have already had a wonderful introduction this morning by Leonard Bugert, who explained you a lot of the science here. Let me just highlight a couple of things. So the NGVLA buys you access to the lowest line transitions of molecular gas, and CO in particular, and that is important because those have the least stringent excitation conditions. And of course, they are the most widespread throughout the galaxy, so you can resolve actually the galaxies at high redshift under disks. Uh, and we already talked about why this is important to do. And you know, it's not just getting that integrated measurement, it's that you can split the sample for which you get those integrated measurements in many different ways. For the, for the local universe, what gets me particularly excited is the fact that the transitions that are brightest after CO are a factor of 10 to 20 fainter than CO. Uh, so they are painful even for ALMA to do. The NGVLA with a much larger collecting area will actually be doing this, you know, routinely. And thank you. Okay, Joe Lazio again, uh, representing Key Science Goal 4, Pulsars, uh, Galactic Center Pulsars and Fundamental Physics. So this image is that wonderful meerkat image which supplemented a or supplanted an earlier VLA image of the Galactic Center. You see all the activity there. I'm not showing an equivalent stellar image, but the stellar density is high there and there are multiple lines of evidence that suggest that there are hot, young, massive stars that should produce neutron stars. Some of the predictions have been as many as a thousand pulsars within the inner parsec or so. But if you actually go to count the number of known pulsars within that region, it's barely a handful. And in fact, if you look at the very close to the center, it's like one, maybe. Uh, actually, one. Uh, the artist impression shows a pulsar orbiting Sag A star, the supermassive black hole. And the key thing about the galactic center is the non uh, the post Newtonian effects could be so strong that you don't need a millisecond pulsar. Any vanilla pulsar would do. Uh, the prevailing explanation has been that a combination of sensitivity and frequency range we haven't had to get the pulsars, the NGVLA will deliver that. And I guess I won't, be in my, uh, over time, I will not tell you about the Fermi Galactic Center access, but you can ask me posters out there and on behalf of the NGVLA, Key Science Goal 4, uh, get involved.
Hello, my name is Avery Eddins, and I'm here on behalf of Key Science Goal 5. We deal with black holes as well as multi-messenger astronomy. On the black hole side of things, we're going to use the NGVLA to investigate black holes on all mass scales. For example, with stellar mass black holes, we want to know how their binaries form. Then for intermediate mass black holes, we want to know if and where they exist. And then for supermassive black holes, we want to know about how they form as well as how they merge with each other. And then on the multi-messenger side of things, we will use the NGVLA to locate both early and late time counterparts to multi-messenger sources. Specifically, as more and better gravitational wave detectors come online and the distance horizon expands, we need the greater sensitivity and resolution of the NGVLA to keep up. Um, this is poster 16 out that door over there, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Anna Ordog. I'm a postdoc at UBC Okanagan and the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. And my poster is about combining single dish and interferometric polarization data uh, for the purpose of producing rotation measure maps of the sky covering all scales from the largest structures down to the resolution of the interferometric component. And in this particular uh, work, we combine data from the uh, Global Magneto-Ionic Medium Survey for the single dish and the Synthesis Telescope Canadian Galactic Plane Survey data uh, for the interferometric component. Um, in the uh, short term, so sorry, I should say we, we, we see this as, a, as a being a, a useful uh, tool for studying uh, galactic magnetic fields uh, by means of their imprint on the uh, diffuse polarization uh, on the sky that we observe. In the short term, we're going to be applying single dish uh, data from a new survey at the DRAO uh, to the Chime Galactic uh, foreground maps. Uh, in the long term, um, doing a similar thing with uh, the upgraded synthesis telescope that's sort of a, a local um, um, component to this. And then globally, in the context of this meeting, uh, this kind of technique will be applicable to uh, data from the NGVLA and the, the SKA polarization studies as well. Uh, so it's poster 56, and uh, thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Suhasini, I'm from University of Alberta, and my poster is about identifying uh, artificial, um, artif I mean, not artificial, but artifacts in interferometric data and quick look, um, VLAS quick look images. And because you see all of these uh, linear uh, side lobes or streaks around big bright sources in VLAS quick look images, um, it can also be caused, it, it can be caused by either side lobes because of the UV pattern itself, or it can be from interference pattern between um, the components that you see. Uh, so identifying these streaks can help you in either quality assurance or it can actually help you classify between false positives and true positives um, sources identified. And we do this using a how transform technique. We actually extend the how transform technique to do this. If you want to know more, the poster is 58 down that door. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. I'm not Nathan Roth. Is Nathan Roth here? Nathan has a fantastic poster. And if it is there, you should go see it. Hi everyone, I'm Haruka Sakemi from Kagoshima University in Japan. Um, I'm interested in uh, whether the galactic extra binary jet can accelerate the cosmic ray particle to very high energy, for example, the 10 to 15 EV. So we focus on the jet terminal region of microgravity SS 433 and investigate the physical property using the JBLA and the LOFA data. And finally, we identified some uh, shock-like features out there, uh, such as very strong magnetic field. And uh, based on that, we calculated the maximum cosmic ray particle energy, uh, which can be accelerated uh, at the jet terminal region. So for more details, please see my uh, poster. The poster number is maybe 60. Yeah, that's all. Thank you.
Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Frank Schinzel. I'm uh, with NREO in Socorro. Um, and uh, my poster is about uh, Fermi unassociated gamma ray sources. So Fermi has been around since 2008, um, and the Large Area Telescope has been creating uh, all sky gamma ray maps. And uh, the one common um, one common denominator over the 12 years of catalogs that have been released already um, is that about one third of the sources detected by Fermi are unassociated, so we don't know what their counterpart are. Um, one of the things that, that Fermi has done is revolutionized uh, gamma ray astronomy, but this was only possible with, uh, with ray telescopes. And uh, you can see um, that hundreds of uh, gamma ray quasars were found by, uh, by Fermi and, um, and also gamma ray pulsars. And there's still a lot of discovery space, um, but which will not be possible um, if we didn't have radio astronomy telescopes. So the future of gamma ray astronomy depends heavily on the future of radio astronomy, which is NGVLA, SK, and DSA 2000. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk more about this, um, come find me or look at my poster. Um, poster number is 61 out that door. Hello, I'm Genevieve Schroeder. I'm at Northwestern University, and my poster is on the radio follow-up of gamma ray bursts, particularly the ones that come from neutron star mergers. Um, it, these mergers create a broadband emission from the X-rays to the radio, but it's actually very difficult to detect it in the radio. However, these radio emission, uh, these radio observations, can still be constraining even if we detect nothing. Um, but we found some very weird things through these radio observations that I chat about at my poster. And also we can look at late times to see if these neutron star mergers may be made a magnetar. Um, I also do long GRB radio follow-up if you're interested in that. And the NGVLA is going to make it a lot easier to detect this kind of stuff. Thank you. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Masumi Shimojo. Uh, I come from the National Astronomical Observatory Japan. So uh, we compare the uh, one to the 9.4 gigahertz uh, solar uh, microwave data with uh, uh, other solar uh, index during a recent two uh, solar cycles uh, to understand the stellar microwave emission from the late type stars. The left panel shows the one with our result. The horizontal axis indicated the uh, Total unsigned magnetic flux of the stars and the vertical axis is a microwave flux observed at one AU distance from the star. So red line uh, indicated the explanated line from the solar thermal data. Thermal data means without uh, flare, solar flare period. So we can see the uh, epsilon Elias data is very near the red line because uh, uh, this emission comes from the thermal plasma uh, of the uh, stellar atmosphere and uh, EK and the uh, far, far from the red line, it is uh, natural because uh, these uh, stellar stars are very active and the, no, uh, the emission comes from non thermal electron. So, uh, so this is a uh, uh, we need the more sensitive telescope, so we need the energy very scale meet. So, thank you very much. So the, my number, uh, postal number is P63. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Michael Stein from the Ruhr University Bochum. If you have ever wondered about uh, halo magnetic fields of spiral galaxies, I would like to present two ways how you can um, trace those with synchrotron emission. So the first one is uh, on, on your left side using synchrotron emission directly, and you can use a spectral analysis to constrain the cosmic ray transport and the galactic magnetic fields on scales of, yeah, let's say something like 10 to 15 kiloparsecs above of the uh, galactic disk. So this is more in the direction of the disk halo interaction phase. But if you're more interested in the CGM overall, you can get some estimates for the galactic magnetic fields based on rotation measurements, or so rotation measure estimates of background galaxies. And you, we can do a statistical analysis of um, sidelines um, that, that cross galactic halos. And there we can also get an estimate for the galactic magnetic field. So if you would, would like to know more about it, just come to my poster over there. Thanks.
Hi everybody, I'm René Ribaldi from INAF Bologna. My poster is about the most abundant population of radio galaxies in the local universe, the so-called FR0. Compact radio galaxies which are characterized by lack of extended emission. FR0 uh, represents the most common radio morphology of nearby early type galaxies uh, which harbor radio loud active supermassive black holes. FR0 completely different from classical FR1 and FR2s, which instead uh, exhibit fully fledged mega particle scale radio morphologies. However, FR0, uh, the nuclear properties, the host properties of nuclear FR0 are indistinguishable from classical FR1 and FR2s, so red ma massive elliptical galaxies. Uh, so the nature of the compactness is not ascribed to the youth of, of uh, radioactivity or jet confinement, so they're not just simply young radio sources. The, um, the, in fact, recent VLBI observation revealed the presence of partial scale jets with low jet sideness, suggesting low jet, uh, low jet speed. The ultimate reason of the compactness of FR0 and the low jet speed is uh, possibly the lower black hole spin than classical FR1 and FR2s. My post is on Slack. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dennis Leahy, University of Calgary. I've been leading a survey in near UV and far UV of M31 using the uh, UVID instrument on AstroSat. So far, we have 19 uh, fields to cover the galaxy compared to uh, three needed for a galaxy, but our spatial resolution is one arc second compared to their four and a half arc second. So we can uh, identify large numbers of stars or clusters in uh, M31 by comparison with the HST data. The goals of this are to uh, study star formation of M31, the history of M31, uh, and structure of M31. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, we use various tools. Um, my poster is number 43, I think, so uh, please come see me for details. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Nick Ferrero. I'm a grad student at UCLA. I work on embedded superstar clusters, which are the largest observed star clusters containing thousands of living O stars tightly packed in diameters on order of around five parsec. Recent theory work uh, shows that star formation in these sufficiently massive superstar clusters follows a unique path from their less massive counterparts, rapidly self-enriching and undergoing a process known as catastrophic cooling. Testing these theories requires massive clusters in nearby galaxies, larger than any found in the Milky Way by at least an order of magnitude. Simply put, we need a larger sample size of these massive uh, clusters that are large enough to trigger catastrophic cooling, but close enough to identify and resolve using current telescope limitations. My poster, P18, which is right outside there, shows the results from our recent VLA uh, survey on these objects and also discusses the role that the NGVLA and SKA might play uh, in future work on these fascinating objects. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mr. Komose of Ilbarak University, uh, reading the science part of the uh, energy, energy uh, study group uh, in NFJ. Uh, this is a companion poster to that uh, introduced by hatsukade san yesterday, reporting the activities of energy various science working groups uh, in Japan. Uh, our group, science working group, is organized, has been, have been organized uh, since 2020, uh, to explore the potential uh, science cases uh, from the Japanese perspective. And as a result of the activities so far, 29 articles uh, discussing uh, original science cases have been released as the Energy Valley J ML series. Uh, in this poster, I introduced three science cases listed here. Uh, tomography of the inner region of protoplanetary disk to uh, discuss the, uh, to uh, discriminate the 
uh, driving mechanism of accretion in the, in the most region of Proprocarinidis, and observation of uh, ammonia snow line uh, showing that the addiction of ammonia snow line is quite promising for nearby Havik A star, and finally the uh, high resolution H1 imaging to uh, explore the multi phase nature of industrial medium at various size scales. So please visit the poster number 51 just outside the door. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Phil Jewell, NREO and North American AMA, and I am crashing with an AMA flash. So AMA has had an amazing first 10 years of operation, and it's helping to motivate the science for both the NGVLA and SKA. But when these two new facilities come online, uh, they will leapfrog the sensitivity of all existing instruments uh, at their operating frequencies. So what are we doing to upgrade AMA so that it will have comparable sensitivity at the millimeter and submillimeter? Well, the wideband sensitivity upgrade will increase system bandwidth by a factor of two. Uh, with a goal of a factor of four, and this will be available this decade. But we're not stopping there. In consultation with uh, our partners, we have a longer term goal of increasing the spectral line sensitivity of ALMA by a factor of 10. And our goal is to have a design and development uh, proposal in front of the decadal survey uh, and, uh, for ASTRO 2030. Uh, if you want more information, uh, come see me or contact our project scientist, Crystal Brogan. Thank you.